From MTN News, this is Montana This Morning. Good morning and welcome to Montana This Morning on this April 20th, 2022. I'm Diane Parker, in for Andrea this week. And we begin in Ukraine, where heavy fighting continues across a 300-mile front in the Donbas region. The U.S. is putting together a large new shipment of artillery and ammunition for Ukraine, rushing to get it to the front in time. Today, Ukraine's president says the Russian invaders will be remembered as perhaps the most barbaric army in the history of the world. Now, he also believes if Ukraines had access to all the weapons they need, they would have ended the war already. The port city of Mariupol is still in the balance with Ukrainian troops narrowly holding on. While across the country, new images show destruction left behind, including mangled cars in Bucha. And meanwhile, President Biden is warning as the war rages on, it will have continuing ripple effects on the world economy. He says 70% of the increase in inflation last month can be blamed on the fighting. Yesterday, the president held a 90-minute call with allies. They discussed how best to continue security and economic humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. And now it is time for a check on the weather with Miller. And I love that everyone is special. Everyone, everyone is, is very, really very special. special. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, everything is beautiful in its own way. It, you know, it really is. How, well, how about the weather? Is it going to be nice? It's going to be a nice day today. Yeah. It's going to be windy, but we're going to see partly cloudy skies, maybe our fair share of sunshine at times. Enjoy it because we do have a big whammy possibly heading our way as we get into Friday and Saturday. Still some uncertainty with that system, but I do anticipate a widespread, we'll call it a precipitation event, rain and snow and we'll delve more into that with the main forecast coming up but right now it's a really nice start here in Yellowstone County uh, across Billings that's a great shot from the Stockman Bank weather cam we do have some clouds out there though 37 right now at the airport feels like 30 winds out the southwest at about nine miles an hour quickly some temperatures across the area Gardner at 31 we've got Absorky sitting at 34 Belfry at 35 down at Clark at 41, Crow Agency sitting at 33, and we're right at the freezing mark in Forsyth where we're trying to see a little bit of rain push into your area. Highs today mainly in the 50s, could see some 40s off to our west and maybe even some 60s down in northern parts of Wyoming. It will be dry for the most part, and then comes the precipitation and we could use it. We'll tell you about that with the main forecast. Come All on. right, yeah, looking forward to that precipitation. Oh, we need it too. Yeah, we really do. Thanks yeah. so much, Miller. Thank you. All right, well, new this morning, brand new numbers show the Billings Fire Department is getting busier each year. The newly released 2021 annual report shows in just 10 years, call volume has increased by 67%. Now, much of that has to do with population growth. The fire department put out 447 fires in 2021. Just over 130 of those were structure fires, but it does respond to EMS and rescue incidents most often. Firefighters helped with more than 40 extrications and saved the lives of at least five people using CPR. And how about this? Crews delivered three babies this year before they could get to the hospital. And this morning, we're continuing to follow a fatal dog attack in Billings that claimed the life of a woman in her 80s. Q2's Casey Conlon brings us the latest updates, including how police are handling this case. The incident happened here on Sandstone Trail just off Alkali Creek Road in the Billings Heights. 84-year-old Melita Hain was attacked on April 8th and later died of her injuries on April 16th. Hain was a longtime resident here at 1132 Sandstone with her husband John. A Billings police report says two callers reported a dog attack at a neighboring house around 6.30 p.m. on the 8th. Officers arrived and immediately called for medical assistance after seeing Haynes' injuries. The Yellowstone County coroner confirmed Tuesday morning that Haynes died due to multiple dog bites. The death was ruled accidental, though police have said they are conducting an active investigation. No arrests have been made or charges filed at this time. Three large mixed breed dogs are now in quarantine at the Yellowstone Valley Animal Shelter. Section 4-405.5 of the Billings City Code says a court shall order euthanasia of an animal involved in a fatal attack on a person. The code also says any owner who keeps any animal exhibiting dangerous behavior is guilty of a misdemeanor, which carries a maximum penalty of six months in jail and a $500 fine. Haynes' family has hired Heenan and Cook Law Firm to represent them. The family and their attorney denied our on-camera interview request until the police investigation is fully finished. According to one former co-worker at the Northern Hotel, Hain was a spitfire that had survived a great deal in her life, loved craft fairs, and always shared her homemade choke cherry syrup with friends. In Billings, Casey Conlon, MTN News.
And this morning, we're catching up with Emily Pennington's mom on the heels of School District 2's decision to change its age out policy. As Q2's Alina Howder learns, the family couldn't be happier to put this saga behind them. It was a long process but it's definitely been worth it. After months of uncertainty, the Pennington family can finally relax. The school board changed policy 2050 Monday night, allowing the 19-year-old student with Down syndrome to graduate with the rest of her class. We are really, really excited. And it's a change that could impact hundreds of other families across the state. Now, other kids that need that additional year, typical kids, regular ed students will have that opportunity to stay. Up until now, the district had an age out policy and the change does mean the district could be left with an annual budget shortfall of more than $3 million. But Emily is just happy to learn she'll get to continue her education. She is just rearing up, trying out for cheerleading again excited to have her senior year. And so is Shanice Garcia. Her 19-year-old daughter, Olivia, has Angelman syndrome and epilepsy. For her, it takes years to learn basic things. As special need parents, we have it hard already. It's very hard and difficult. And went through a similar process just last year with the Columbus High School District. I was just asking for another year for her because she needs to be socialized or she becomes depressed and aggressive. I literally spent the whole summer and the first three months of school fighting and calling OPI. Both families believe the right decision has been made, but says even more needs to be done. It never should have been that hard for it to even come to that point. Hopefully we can prevent this from happening to other um, parents with children with special needs in the state of Montana, because it just really isn't right. In Billings, Alina Howder, MTN News. And this morning, we're getting a clearer picture about what a giant medical team up means for Billings residents. St. Vincent merged with Intermountain Healthcare, creating the 11th largest nonprofit health system in the country. And now we're hearing from the CEO who says rural health care is a focus. He wants the best care for everyone, no matter where they live. He adds that outside of the benefits, you probably won't even notice a merger has happened. Day to day operations should stay the same and maybe even, you know, we'll be able to add some services. Um, we're not expecting um, to lose staff. In fact, this is about growth. We, we hope to retain all of the great people who work um, here in the Billings footprint, uh, in the Montana footprint. So I, I don't think any big day-to-day -day changes, but I do hope that people will watch to see how we contribute to the communities we're in. That's something that Intermountain has historically done very well, and I know that's been dear to SEO Health's heart as well. Watch us be good community partners. They also hope to use their combined efforts to keep healthcare as affordable as possible. And officials say the main objective is not to make money, but to provide the best individual care that people can have. The latest now on an ongoing fight in the legislature to limit property taxes on Montana homeowners. As MTN's Jonathan Ambrarian reports, some lawmakers are on board, but others fear the measure will hurt local governments. On Tuesday, state lawmakers said they heard the message that Montanans were concerned about rising property taxes, but that Constitutional Initiative 121 wasn't the right way to address the issue. I think that that's part of what we want the folks out in Montana to understand about this initiative is that, you know, that there's no good choices for the legislature in order to implement this. The Revenue Interim Committee voted unanimously Tuesday to oppose CI 121. It came after a panel discussion where local government and business leaders argued the measure would either significantly disrupt local services or shift the tax burden to other sources, depending on how the legislature implemented it. This is an issue that really needs to be discussed in a full legislative session to discuss comprehensive tax reform in our state and take it piece by piece responsibly and effectively and efficiently. CI 121 would base residential properties assessed value on what it was in 2019, then limit any increases in value based on the rate of inflation, except when the property is sold or significantly improved. It would also limit overall residential property taxes to 1% of assessed value. Matthew Monfortin is one of the measure's sponsors. People are gonna continue moving into Montana there's going to continue to be upward pressures of real estate values here in Montana and upward pressure on property taxes. And we need to do something about that or more of us are going to start getting taxed out of our homes. 
State leaders estimate CI-121 could reduce property tax collections by $175 million a year going forward, with much of the impact falling on local governments. Monforton says the measure is designed to cap the rate of growth, not cut existing revenues. And he argued leaders shouldn't rely on such large tax increases. It's a great system for legislators, for special interests, for government bureaucrats. It's good for everyone except for Montana homeowners. On Tuesday afternoon, the Revenue Committee did have a discussion about some other possible options for reducing residential property taxes. It's part of a larger study being done into the property tax system set up during the last legislative session. In Helena, Jonathan Amvarian, MTN News. A major conservation effort over the last century has helped restore America's bison population. But as reporter Vanessa Mishanya explains, the new species is facing a new threat that could derail all that work. Here, buffalo, buffalo, come on in. Yeah, I worked for a general farm organization for 25 years and then decided to have a midlife crisis. Just about anybody that's in the bison business will tell you once you get into it, you just fall in love. After giving me a ride out to his bison herd on his four-wheeler, Dave Carter makes it known that his job goes way beyond raising his 300 animals. He's in it to build back a symbol of America. You've got some curious ones coming up here behind you. They once dwindled from 50 million to 750 animals, but the numbers of bison today, between ranching, tribal, and national parks, are at 500,000. The heart of it is this magnificent animal that has been part of this ecosystem, so the ecosystems of, of North America for thousands of years. It's kind of special. We all feel like we're part of that restoration story. However, the current chapter of that story is being written by a microscopic opponent threatening the very progress he and others like him have worked so hard to make. As bison producers, we, we want our animals to only have one bad day. And we want those herds to be healthy. And when you see something like that and you're really powerless to do something about it, it's just, uh, it's devastating. What he's talking about is Mycoplasma bovis, a bacteria that can quickly wither away a bison. And scientists say it has the ability to take out up to 60% of a herd. Last year, it killed 30% of Dave's animals. He says it is a terrible challenge stacked up next to a series of obstacles. With the drought and navigating through the economic challenges we've had with the COVID pandemic, then along comes mycoplasma. And it's, a, for many producers, it's economically a, a fatal blow. Antibiotics such as penicillin uh, are ineffective because those um, uh, treatments specifically target a cell wall which they lack. Jeff Martin is the director of research at the Bison Center of Excellence at South Dakota State University. The team has assembled a task force to figure out a solution to the mycoplasma problem, which he says has been made worse by drought conditions across the plains. It's not just that you're having poor forage quality, you also have poor access to water. And so as they're having to drink these uh, less quality waters, that just is another compounding factor for their immune function. Bison, when, when the storm hits, they, they face into it and they lower their heads and they just walk into the storm and they survive. As teams of ranchers, tribes, conservationists, and scientists work to save the animal, people like Dave have hoped that this is just another storm to be weathered by this hardy symbol of American history. These challenges come along, but we just gotta lower our head and we gotta face the storm and, and work our way through it. In Strasburg, Colorado, I'm Vanessa Mishanya reporting.